I'd like you all to close your eyes. And I want you to think of a person or think of people who are not like you. Think of people who don't care as much as you do, people who aren't as smart as you are, people who judge, and people who overlook some of the world's most pressing problems. Now open your eyes. For me, these people were climate change skeptics, hunters who drove big, loud trucks with gun racks in the back, and Christians who thought that I, as a Hindu, was going to hell. But now I've learned that these people are my greatest teachers, and that these people are just like me. Now, I'm not trying to be cute. Physiologically and psychologically, we're the same. Our DNA is more than 99% the same. And as a human species, we seek two things, agency and communion. Agency is the desire to get ahead, to achieve mastery, and to individuate. And communion is the desire to get along and to relate to others. So we think people aren't like us, but perhaps they're just like us. And that's what I'd like you to consider today as we explore the ways in which we engage and the way our stories transform. I'd like to talk about what happens here, right? Because most of how we engage and see the world happens in our green brain. And what I mean by green brain is our consciousness about the world, about our environment. Environment comes from the French word avironné, which means to surround or encircle. And my circle changed dramatically when I moved from New York City to a place in the middle of the United States, a place called Kansas. Now, Kansas is a place that people call a flyover state, meaning a state that you fly over in a plane, not one that you visit or live in. And that's too bad, because aside from being the birthplace of Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz, Kansas is a place with vast natural gas resources and the number two wind capacity in the United States. Kansas is a place where our cattle are grown and our wheat, most of the wheat in the United States, is grown. Right? Kansas is the heartland and the breadbasket of the United States. And people there have an intimate connection to the land. Right? A drought in New York City might make us a little hot and a little uncomfortable on the train. But a drought in Kansas devastates the land and devastates the economy. Yet despite this connection, most people in Kansas don't call themselves environmentalists. In fact, they'd be surprised to know that they have been my greatest teachers in being an environmentalist. I'm a journalist and a journalism educator who tells stories about our world. But over the last five years, these stories have become increasingly difficult to tell. The schisms that we're experiencing across um, political divides, socioeconomic divides, race, gender, and geography obscure the urgency and the cooperation that's required to work together to solve some of our most pressing global problems. In order to transform our world, we have to transform how we engage with each other. So I'd like to introduce you to someone. His name is Cade. He teaches technology at the university where I teach journalism. And Cade has transformed my stories. Now, let me tell you, Cade um, was raised by a single mother. He grew up in a trailer. Uh, Cade served in the US military, but never left North America. He's a libertarian who goes to church every single Sunday. He doesn't swear, and he drinks milk with his dinner. Now, um, I'm an Indian, born in Germany. Uh, my parents and I immigrated to the United States when I was a child. My father has an MD and a PhD. And while we grew up in a modest home, my sister and I, it was definitely bigger than a double-wide trailer. 
Right? I walk fast, I talk fast, and I swear a lot. <laughs> and the only milk that I drink is in my morning coffee, and it's unsweetened almond milk. I am a complete left-leaning hippie, and I am just like Cade. And we learned this when Cade shared tomatoes that he had grown in his garden, and we realized that we both shared a love of local food. But while Cade hunts it, I gather it. Now, to kill this bird, Cade woke up at 4.30 on a cold spring morning. He uh, dressed head to toe in camouflage, and he um, set out a decoy, he crouched, he found a tree, and he sat under a tree for two and a half hours, hardly moving. Now, when the moment was right, Cade called for that bird. I'm trying to sound like a rooster, a uh, hen. I'm trying to call a rooster, right? So what Kate does is he describes to me the moment when he gets the rooster's attention, right? He tells me that the strut, the 20-minute strut that the rooster takes from uh, where he's been coming from toward the decoy hen, those moments he describes as exhilarating and awesome. Right? He describes the way the feathers of the bird drag on the ground, the sound of those feathers. He talks about the bird spitting and drumming. And in those moments, I am completely captivated by this story. I'm a complete peacenik, but I'll tell you, I want to hear this story. And then Kay describes the moment when he raises his 12-gauge shotgun and he kills this bird. And then afterward, he thanks me for hearing his story for listening to him. Now, Cade hunts many birds. An average um, mature bird weighs about 25 pounds or about 11 and a half kilos. Cade may carry one or he may carry a few back to his truck, that truck with the gun rack in the back. Right? He drives home. He um, prepares the bird for storage by first um, skinning the bird, then snipping its wings and snipping its feet, he then guts the bird, cuts the bird, and prepares it for freezing. All in all, this takes about three and a half hours. Now, contrast this with me gathering my bird. I get in my car, I drive to our local food co-op, I find the free-range, antibiotic-free bird in the freezer, I pay for this bird, I drive home. Door to door, this takes me about 20 minutes. Who is the bigger environmentalist? Cade is far more intimate with the sources of his food than I will ever be. Cade conserves natural resources because they make good common sense. Cade drives an efficient car more because it saves money than it saves the planet. And Cade would never call himself an environmentalist, despite the fact that he can build his own shelter, grow and hunt his own food. That title of environmentalist is reserved for left-leaning hippies like me. So this disassociation is one over shared affiliations, not one over a shared desire for clean food and resource conservation. So while the term environmentalist has become polarized and politicized, our desire to conserve, our desire to protect and to be environmental stewards doesn't have to be. There's another teacher, an incredible teacher to me. He's the president of our local bank. His name is Doug, and he's a thoughtful and respected conservative who is unsure about the human impacts on climate change. Now, I'm the daughter of scientists. I didn't know someone could be thoughtful and respected and unsure of the human impact on climate change until I met Doug. And until I realized his confusion is not only about the science, the messenger matters. And for climate change, the messengers have largely been one politician, Al Gore, right? several polar bears on melting ice flows, and scores of dire messages about um, invisible gases that in the atmosphere far away are over time causing the equivalent of an environmental Armageddon. Pests, floods, droughts, increased hunger and disease, uh, these messages were and are too daunting 
and they're too far away in time and space, and for some, in worldview. Now, I'll be honest with you. I thought once Doug and I became friendly, I could convince him. I could give him enough information. I could share the facts, and his beliefs about climate change would change. But psychologists have almost no evidence that information changes people's decision-making. We tend to believe the facts and embrace the facts that already confirm our worldview. It's called confirmation bias. And we tend to disregard the facts that don't align with that view. This is how we make sense of the world. Yale psychologist Tony Lyserowitz says that as a human species, we didn't evolve to handle the complex problems that we're seeing today. I mean, that we're still walking around with the same brains that we had 200,000 years ago. So, I can tell you that 925 million people on the planet are hungry. I can tell you that one, one child every five seconds, 16,000 children will die today as we sit here at TED due to hunger-related causes. Or I can show you this. We process information in different ways. What we see, and more importantly, what we directly experience, matters. We, um, we think, right, that we um, are incredibly evolved, and that the place between our ears is incredibly evolved and complex. But in many ways, this is still a dull instrument. We can't fathom the magnitude of global hunger or climate change or genocide. Risk researcher Paul Slovic says that we start to desensitize after magnitudes of one. Right? And this is why I can care for my friend Doug's daughter's asthma. This is the information that we share. Right? He's not sure about climate change, but what he is sure about is our coal plant. Our local coal plant is exacerbating his daughter's asthma. Right? The particulate pollution from the coal plant is making her respiratory problems worse. I can consider her, and I can care about her. But my brain can't fathom the 81 million Americans who are dealing with compromised air quality and particulate pollution every day. Now, the reason I share this with you is because the reason we engage and the way we engage in the world is not because we're stupid, is not because we're lazy, and it's not because we don't care. There's only so much that our green brains can handle. So the key for us is to figure out how to tell the stories in a way that connects to our 200,000-year-old green brains. And there is a way to do this, right? Um, I want to tell you a little bit more first about what happens in here. When I see a snake in my garden, whether it's poisonous or not, my uh, inclination and my brain activity is that the entire brain lights up, right? I have an immediate threat in my immediate environment and I'm ready to act on it. Now, the two degrees Celsius warming of the planet ignites a small part of the brain. It's called the prefrontal cortex. It's just behind the forehead. Developmental, developmental processes in the brain occur from a back to front pattern, right? And the prefrontal cortex develops last. This is the part of the brain connected with the future. And this is also why, when we're teenagers, we take incredible risks. We think we're going to live forever. Right? As we get older, we become more risk-averse. And we tend to underestimate bigger losses to avoid the certainty of smaller ones. So that means we cling to our energy-consumptive, energy-intensive consumptive lives, right? Because we're scared what a loss of comfort might mean, right? To lose our cars, to lose our air conditioning, to be uncomfortable in the moment. Without thinking about what this way of living and doing and being could mean for the future. We simply can't comprehend it. It's not because we don't care. Harvard University researcher Daniel Gilbert says that humans respond to four kinds of threats. Threats that are instantaneous, 
threats that are um, imminent, that are coming toward us, threats that are personalized, and threats that are in some way repulsive to us. All other threats fall through. We simply can't hold on to them. So I could bombard you with images of starving children. I could show you images like this one taken by photographer Chris Jordan. He took this image at Midway, right? This uh, image of a bird with a belly full of plastic. One third of albatrosses on Midway Island in the North Pacific die because they mistake plastic for food. We will all feel sad. I don't think there's a single person in this room who doesn't feel pain looking at the images that I have just shown you. But what most of us will do, right, is then go back to worrying about our daily lives and what's in uh, what researchers Patricia Linville and Gregory Fisher call our finite pool of worry. There's only so much that we can worry about at once. This isn't to say that we can't make stories of humans and of birds relevant to people, but the way to make information relevant is not to ask people to think about or worry about something new, especially not something that's far away in time or space. The stories have to be close to us, emotionally or physically. Right? Or we have to displace what's already in someone's pool of worry. Right? There's only a certain amount of things we can worry about. If you want me to worry about the polar bears on the ice floes or the birds on, Misway, on Midway, you have to take out something that's already in my pool of worry. Right? And what this also means is that when we talk about these issues, we have to talk about them in a way that addresses people's immediate concerns. Everyone in here has some experience of the economic crisis. And what we know is people's concern and awareness about the environment diminishes when people are concerned about the economy. So the way we tell these stories is one that addresses those concerns and touches on those concerns. Right? The way to tell the story of the birds on Midway is to bring it closer to us, to first tell the story of our relationship with plastic. Now, I'll tell you, I'm uh, an environmental storyteller. I actually embrace the term storytelling. And I thought I had it all figured out. First, I thought it was the facts, right? Bombard people with the information. Give them all of the science. Now we know. People don't make meaning of the facts on their own or in isolation. They choose the facts that connect to what they already believe in. Okay, so then I thought it's the business case. And when I say I, I mean myself and a number of other people who try to tell the stories of social and environmental engagement and sustainability. Make the business case. I would say this to my students, talk about the bottom line efficiencies. Absolutely. But we're not purely rational beings and we don't always maximize value or utility, right? If we did, we'd always buy the cheapest things but we don't. We buy and love things because they bring joy to our lives or because they're beautiful. We recognize that value exists beyond the bottom line. So then there's the trend, right? Green is the new black. Green is sexy and cool. Trends rise and fall. Our dependence on our natural world didn't diminish in any way. In fact, it increased, despite the fact that most media stopped talking about it. All of these tactics are important, but incomplete. Our engagement with the environment isn't just about scientific facts or the electrical grid or greenhouse gas emissions or cool green gadgets. It's about our relationships, our relationship to our natural world our relationship with each other, our relationship to ourselves and to what we hold sacred. And this is what I share with the Christian farmers from Kansas who feed me. We have very, very different versions of the afterlife, right? I'm not really present in their afterlife. <laughs> but I will tell you, on this, in this life, on this earth, we share common purpose. And that's to live in a way that reflects our most deeply held values. Right? Um, we used to say, there was this in, in the environmental community, that we can save the planet in 10 easy steps. But that wasn't true. 
These relationships that we have with the earth, with each other, are messy and complex and dynamic. And what we know about our most important relationships is the ones that we worked hardest on are the ones that reap the most reward. Our relationship with our natural world is enduring and it is vital. So we can't save the planet in 10 easy steps, right? Every step is one step on a long journey. We do know that personal action is the first step towards systemic change. In order to change the system, we have to change the way we engage. And in order to change the way we engage, we have to tell different stories. Stories that connect with our green brain. Stories that are personalized and immediate. Stories that are inspiring visions of the world that we want now. One that is resilient and thriving. There's something else that we're hardwired to have, right? There's something else that's in this green brain of ours. We have a predisposition toward cooperation and helpfulness. And this becomes activated when we socialize with others. So um, when we engage with others, when we are helpful and generous, what's activated in the brain are what's called reward circuits. They're the same parts of the brain that light up when we um, make love or win a prize. <laughs> they make us happy. Being generous, balancing agency with communion brings us joy. And what also brings us joy and makes us happy is sharing our stories, right? Because it's through stories that we understand and love each other. It's because we don't just tell stories, we are our stories. Doug gave a face to a climate skeptic, right? Cade gave a story to a hunter and a libertarian. We don't always get along, but we strive to find common ground. We struggle to understand each other because we care about each other. Kate is no longer a hunter and a veteran and a libertarian and all these things. Kate is just my friend. Right? And that's what we have to do. I know we can do it. So I'd like you to again close your eyes. Right? And I'd like you to return to that image of the person who's not like you. The people who are not like you. And now open your eyes. Here's the thing. We can't save the planet. We can't solve our most pressing global problems without them, without us. I know this is incredibly difficult, right, to reach out. It's uncomfortable and it's hard, uh, especially to reach out to someone like this guy. So I was at an energy conference and this man sat in front of me with his t-shirt that says he doesn't believe in global warming and that carbon dioxide is not polluting and that wind power is not free and abundant. And I thought, what is this man doing here? He's in the wrong place. Well, after the speaker was done, the speaker's name is Richard, this man in the yellow shirt approached him and he said, excuse me, sir you've been talking about environmental justice and the idea that the poorest communities, communities of color and low-income communities are the ones where the most polluting industries are cited, right? And he said, I have the same problem in my community, right? We're a poor county and our plastics factory is hurting people in our community. I know there's a problem here. Will you help me? And I was within earshot of this and I thought to myself, okay, if these two can get along and connect and find common ground, any of us can. So that's my challenge to you here today. I want you to think about those people who are not like you, but who are completely like you. I want you to listen to them. I want you to hear what's in their pool of worry and then I want you to tell your stories in a way that they can hear, that addresses their concerns. It's not us and them. 
It's we, right? And it is only when us and them become we that we can solve these problems together. So I'd like to end with one last image. This is from a mural in uh, Lawrence, Kansas. It's an excerpt of a poem by a woman named Gwendolyn uh, Brooks. And when I saw this poem, I knew that that flat flyover state of Kansas was home. So I would like you to read this with me, and I would like you to carry this with you out of this room into the world in the place where you will affect change and make everything the beautiful and an abundant world we want it to be. So let's please read together. We are each other's harvest. We are each other's business. We are each other's magnitude and bond. Thank you.